الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه آمين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Continuing on in our series on the seerah and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Last week we looked at the first hijrah in Islam And that was the hijrah, the migration to Al-Habasha, to Abyssinia And we looked at some of the reasons that led the Muslims to eventually migrate to Abyssinia. And so all in all, what we have learned so far in the seerah, from the beginning of the da'wah of the Prophet wasallam until now, what we have seen is that the Muslims have been persecuted for their deen due to their limited numbers and due to their overall weakness in the face of their hostile opponent Quraysh who until now have tried to do everything they can to put an end to the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they've tried to do everything they can to put out the light of Islam. And so it was in these grim circumstances that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to empower and to strengthen the Muslims to a certain degree. Obviously, while they're in Mecca, they're not going to have the upper hand. And this continued until eventually they had to migrate to Medina, as we will see later on. But there did come a time when after absolute weakness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Muslims some kind of strength that allow them to more openly practice their deen. And this is what we're going to talk about today because it was around this time after the Hijrah, the first Hijrah to Abyssinia, around this time that we have the conversion to Islam. The conversion to Islam of two very, very important figures, two very important men, through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthened, strengthened Islam and the Muslims. So who were these two men? They were Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Umar ibn Khattab. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the paternal uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as well as Umar ibn Al-Khattab ibn Nufayl. And so let us look at what led both of these great men to embrace Islam and what resulted in them converting to Islam, how it supported and strengthened the Muslims. So we start tonight with Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Hamza radiallahu anhu was 
known to be a hunter. And so he would often go out, go out in the desert and hunt. And when he would return to Mecca, he would tell his stories of his expeditions. And so one day when he was out hunting, it so happened that Abu Jahl approached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and started to curse him. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was silent and he did not respond back. This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَأَعْرِضْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Turn away from the ignorant. Ignore them. Let them curse you, let them insult you. Don't busy yourself with them. And so we learn from this that a Muslim should not get sidetracked by trivial issues. And we mentioned this previously. If you're busy in giving da'wah, do not turn your da'wah into a personal matter. And so if insults are directed to you because of you preaching Islam, then ignore it. Ignore it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that if they are insulting you, O Muhammad, قَدْ نَعْلَمُ إِنَّهُ لَيَحْزُنُكَ الَّذِي يَقُولُ We know that you are grieved by what they say about you. And then Allah says, فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَ وَلَكِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ يَجْحَدُونَ It is not you, O Muhammad, that they are saying that, you know, you are not trustworthy. Your, your honesty is in question. No, they're not insulting you personally. It's not about you. But rather, the Zalimun, they are denying the signs of Allah. It is Islam that they are denying. It is Islam that they are cursing and insulting. Not you. Don't take it personally. And we also see from the life of the Prophet ﷺ how he would never get angry or take revenge. He wouldn't take personally what people do to him or he wouldn't get angry over things that we often get angry about. Personal things in our lives. But he would get angry only when the rights of Allah are violated. That's when he would stand up and he would become angry. But other than that, if it's something personal, he wouldn't, he wouldn't get angry. And so this is something very important for us to learn from. To get angry for the sake of Allah and to stand up for the deen of Allah. But if you are attacked personally, ignore it. So anyways, Abu Jahl comes and starts cursing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then, after seeing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not responding, he took a stone and threw it at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's head. And so, there happened to be a slave girl nearby who saw what had happened. And so when Hamza returned from his hunting expedition that day, she told him what had happened. Being the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when Hamza heard what Abu Jahl had done, he became very upset. He became upset over what was happening to his nephew. Even though Hamza at this time was still a kafir. But because of this relationship between him and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he felt as if an attack on him 
on on Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was an attack on Hamza and Quraysh, his family, or you know this particular family in Quraysh, Bani Hashim. And so Hamza walked up to Abu Jahl as he was sitting with his cronies around the Kaaba. And remember, he had just come back from hunting. And so he still had his bow with him. And so he went up to Abu Jahl and he took his bow and he hit Abu Jahl on his face with it. And then he said to him, do you curse him? Do you curse him when I follow his religion? In another narration it says, how dare you curse him? And then he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And he said, I testify that what he has brought is the truth from Allah. Now, when Hamza said this, he did not say it with conviction. Initially, he did this out of revenge, you know, to stand up for his nephew. He did it out of tribal pride to anger Abu Jahl and to stand up for, for his family. And so when this incident occurred and Abu Jahl is now bleeding, Seeing this, the family of Abu Jahl got up and they wanted to fight Hamza. But then Banu Hashim stood up and they were going to defend him. And so a huge fight was about to erupt. And so this is where Abu Jahl intervened and said, no, leave Hamza alone because I did indeed shamelessly attack his nephew, Muhammad. Now, when Hamza went back home that night, there's a narration that mentions that he was surprised at what happened and his own personal response. When his emotions calmed down, he started to assess the situation. And when he did, he thought that he was in big trouble. Because he was now questioning his Islam. You know, did I really say the Shahada? Did I really say to them, I, you know, I'm now a Muslim too? And so he was confused now. Because if he withdraws and goes back on his word, then he's dishonoring his word. And, you know, he had already told Abu Jahl that he had become a Muslim. And in their culture, it wasn't considered right to go back on your word. So it was difficult. It was a difficult position that he was in. At the same time, he thought it's difficult for me to commit. Uh, you know, how on earth did I become a Muslim? I don't believe in in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so Hamza says in that narration, he says that I spent my whole night praying to God, asking him to guide me to the truth and to tell me if I have done the right thing or not. Now, what we notice here is that the mushrikun, they recognized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, when they would make dua, they would make dua to Allah. Yet, if you ask them why they worship idols then, they say, these are intermediaries between us and Allah. And so, their religion was you know, a religion of confusion. 
and we mentioned this previously as well, that they recognize deep down inside that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one and only true God. But they will still worship idols and they would associate partners with Allah. And this is something that Allah has mentioned in the Quran. This is something that Allah has mentioned numerous times in the Quran in order to refute their concept of shirk and worshiping others besides Allah. Anyways, in the morning, Hamza radiallahu anhi says, I woke up that morning and I felt my heart was filled with love for Islam. And so I went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I told him that I am a Muslim. So this was one of the greatest moments for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to now have his dear uncle Hamza on his side. And so this is how Hamza radiallahu an became a Muslim. And thus Abu Jahl probably thought he was harming Islam. When he went and cursed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but he does not realize that as a result, they lost one of their strong men, and that was Hamza, radiallahu an. And this is from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa taala that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He brings good to us from sources we never imagine from places we least expect Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrul lakum Perhaps you may dislike something but there is good in it for you And so Ibn Ishaq, he says, the Islam of Hamza was out of pride, out of hamiya, but then it turned into sincerity. So you see how his Islam initially began out of tribal pride and wanting to take revenge. It was insincere. It wasn't solely for the sake of Allah, but then eventually it was solely for the sake of Allah. And we see that for the rest of the life of Hamza radiallahu an, he lived to his word and he did indeed enter into Islam wholeheartedly. And he supported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with all of his might and his courage. And so with the Islam of Hamza, the Muslims now had some strength. And it is mentioned in the books of Sirah that after the Islam of Hamza, some of the persecution that the Mushrikun would do to the Muslims started to lessen. Started to lessen. We move on after that to the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, which is a bit longer. And so Umar radiallahu an was a staunch enemy of Islam. He was from the tribe of Quraysh, but not from the same, or not that close to the Prophet ﷺ. So Hamza is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. As for Umar, his lineage goes back several uh, ancestors before it meets with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nonetheless, he was a staunch enemy of Islam. He was ruthless and known for his brutality in persecuting the Muslims. And so one day, Layla, who was the wife of one of the companions, by the name of Amir ibn Rabi'ah, she met Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an. And so Umar, he said to her, where are you heading? 
And so he saw that she was packing up and getting ready to leave. And her husband had gone out, so she was alone. So she said, you have mistreated us. You have oppressed us. So I am leaving to one of the lands of God where I will be able to worship Allah freely. And so basically she was getting ready to leave to Al-Habasha, to, to Abyssinia. And so she says that she noticed the face of Umar change. The kind of face that she had never seen in Umar. And so he felt sad and regretful. And so Umar said to her, may peace be with you, leave in peace. And so this was a very strange statement coming from Umar because he was known for his brutality. He wasn't known for his sympathy towards any of the Muslims. And so his response also shocked. Layla radiallahu anha, Um Abdullah. And so that was the end of the conversation between them. Umar radiallahu anha, he leaves. And so later on, when her husband came, she told him what had happened and she told him of the response of Umar. And so when he heard, he started to laugh and he said, Do you think that? Umar is going to become a Muslim? And so she said, yes, why not? And so he said, well, Umar will not become a Muslim. He said, لن يسلم عمر حتى يسلم حمار الخطار That Umar will not become a Muslim until his father's donkey becomes a Muslim. Basically, it's impossible for him to become a Muslim. We know him. We know the kind of enemy he is. And so this is the impression that the Sahaba had for Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh. Umar narrates, he says that I used to love drinking wine. And I had partners who we would go out every night, we would meet and we would get drunk. So I went that evening to meet with my friends. When he reached when he reached the place, their meeting place, their pub, he didn't find anyone there. And it happened to be very late at night. So he said, I decided to go to the wine dealer but I found that his shop was closed. I went around looking for other options, but I didn't find anyone. And so now, since everything is closed, then why not go to the Kaaba and make tawaf? So Umar radiallahu anhu says, I went to make tawaf around the Kaaba. And there's no one there, except for one person. Who would be there at this late night of the hour? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar says, there was no one there but me and Muhammad. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not sense my presence. In one narration, it says that Umar says, I wanted to sneak in and attack him. In another narration, it says, that he wanted to listen to what he was reciting. So Umar says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would pray with the Kaaba in front of him towards the direction of Al-Aqsa. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to do this before the Qibla was changed to the Kaaba. And so he wanted to always pray towards the Kaaba. And Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Baqarah When Allah mentions the changing of the Qibla To Al-Masjid Al-Haram 
to the Kaaba. And so the Prophet ﷺ was supposed to only pray towards Al-Aqsa, but he would make the Kaaba in between him and Masjid Al-Aqsa. And so he would be praying at that side of the Kaaba that would have the black stone. Umar says, I went from behind between the cloth of the Kaaba and the Kaaba. So Umar had his back towards the Kaaba and he had the cloth of the Kaaba in front of him. And he was approaching the Prophet ﷺ. Umar says, I was sneaking behind the Kaaba until I was right in front of Muhammad ﷺ. Nothing was between me and him except the cloth of the Kaaba. But he could not see me. And I was able to hear his recitation. He was right in front of me and he was reciting from Surah al haqqah Umar says, I just froze there and I was listening to his recitation to these wonderful words of the Quran. And I told myself, such beautiful words. These must be the words of a poet, a sha'ir. So as soon as he said that, the Prophet وسلم, what was the next ayah that he recited? وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُ These are not the words of a sha'ir, a poet. Little is it that you believe. So Umar says he was shocked. And then he said, then these must be the words of a soothsayer, a fortune teller. How on earth does he know what I'm saying? It must be a fortune teller, someone who knows the future, or someone who could communicate with the jinn who's telling him this. And so right after that, what is the next ayah? وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُ Nor are they the words of a kahin, a soothsayer, a fortune teller. Little is it that you remember. Umar radiallahu an says, that was the first step in bringing me towards Islam. So from then on, the foundation of kufr in the heart of Umar ibn Khattab was starting to crack. Nevertheless, his heart was still filled with hatred for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims. And so one day, Umar radiallahu anh decided that he was going to bring an end to this misery and this friction and this disunity that was brought by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the Meccans and to Quraysh. And so he decided that today I'm going to go and kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no matter what happens. And so he had this dedication. He believed that he needed to rid his people of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so he found out that the Muslims would meet and gather in Dar al-Arqam, something we mentioned previously, that they would meet secretly in this place called Dar al-Arqam. And on that day, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there with 40 of his companions. And so Umar picked up his sword and he started to walk down the streets of Mecca, heading towards Dar al arqa Now, Umar knew very well that if he tries to kill him, then, you know, he's going to be killed. They're not going to leave him alone. But he was determined to do it. And so, he was walking down the streets of Mecca and on his way, he happened to meet one of his relatives. And so this relative of his, Naim, seeing that Umar is extremely angry and upset and he has a sword in his hand, he sensed danger. And so he asked, Oh Umar, where are you heading? 
And so Umar said, I'm going to Muhammad to kill him. And so Naim, he was a Sahabi, he had to think of something right away. You know, how can he stop him? What can he do to protect the Prophet ﷺ? He had to think of something on the spot. And so he said, Oh Umar, why don't you go take care of your own household first? And so Umar said, Why? What's wrong with my own household? And so Naim told him, Your sister has become a Muslim. Your sister has become a Muslim. And so his sister, Fatima, bint al-Khattab, she had become a Muslim and Umar radiallahu anh, had not known about it. And she was married to another companion. She was married to one of the greatest companions, Sa'id ibn Zaid ibn Amr ibn Nufayd. Sa'id ibn Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayd. We mentioned previously the father of Sa'id. The father of Sa'id, he was Zayd ibn Amr. Who was he? He was one of those who used to worship Allah alone before Islam. He was one of those few monotheists, Hunafa. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he is in Jannah. So his son, Sa'id, was one of those who accepted Islam. And one of the ten who the Prophet ﷺ promised with Jannah. One of the Ashara al Mubashirina bil Jannah. One of the ten who the Prophet ﷺ mentions in one hadith that these ten individuals are promised with Jannah. Now, Sa'id ibn Zayd is related to Umar radiallahu anhu. And so Zayd, the father, was a cousin of Umar radiallahu anhu. So after hearing this, after Umar hears this shocking news, he immediately changes course. And now he starts heading towards the house of his sister. And it so happened that at that time, one of the other companions, Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu. And we mentioned Khabbab previously, when we spoke about the persecution of the Sahaba, one of those who was persecuted very badly was Khabbab ibn al-Arat. He happened to be there at her home teaching her and her husband the Qur'an. And he had a scroll with him that had on it some ayat of the Qur'an that he was teaching to them. And these ayat were from Surah Taha. So when they heard the footsteps of Umar radiallahu an outside the door, Khabbab immediately went into hiding. And Fatima, his sister, took the scrolls and hid it under her thigh. Umar, he came in and he said, what was that that I was hearing? He was talking about the Quran. And so they said, we didn't hear anything. And so Umar ibn Khattab, he says, yes, I did hear something. You were reciting something. Tell me what it is. And so... He added, and I have also heard that you have become a Muslim. And so immediately he attacks her husband, Saeed ibn Zayd, and he takes him to the ground and he starts punching him. After that, Fatima radiallahu anha tries to intervene to defend her husband, and so Umar he strikes her as well until she starts to bleed. And so when he 
he saw this blood, he became extremely regretful. And so he became sorry. And he said to her, or she said, yes, we have become Muslims. And do whatever you want, we're not going to leave Islam. And so after that, Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, give me the scroll that you were reading from. And so she said, no. And Umar said, I swear, you know, he swore by, he swore in the name of his gods that he will give it back to her. He thought that, you know, uh, or she thought that he was asking for the scrolls to destroy them. But Umar just wanted to read what was in it. So he swore in the name of his gods that I'll give it back to you. But she said, no, you are not a Muslim. You are impu impure. And so he went, it is mentioned in the narration, he went, he made ghusl, and then he returned. And then she gave him the scroll. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, he read these ayat from Surah Taha. Taha ma anzalna. We have not revealed the Qur'an to you, O Muhammad, to cause you distress. Except as a reminder for those who fear, who fear Allah. It is a revelation from the one who created the heavens, the earth and the high heavens. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahman Allah has established, elevated, rose above the throne. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on earth and whatever is between and whatever is underneath the earth. Whether you speak openly or not, he certainly knows what is secret and what is even more hidden. Allah, there is none worthy of worship except Him. He has the most beautiful names. And so when Umar finished reciting, he said, these are wonderful words. When Khabbab ibn al-Arat heard what Umar had said, remember? Khabbab went into hiding. So when he heard what Umar had said, he came out and he said, Oh Umar, I hope that Allah will choose you because I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only yesterday making dua to Allah. That, Oh Allah, guide one of the two Umars. Umar ibn al-Khattab or Umar ibn Hisham. Umar ibn al-Khattab or Amr ibn Hisham. Who was Amr ibn Hisham? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was his kunya, but his real name was Amr ibn Hisham. And so Khabbab, he said to him, I hope that you are the one who Allah will choose. And so just a day before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had made dua to Allah to guide one of the two. And he did so because he knew that the Muslims are in need of support, of strength. And it can happen with one of these two men. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he told Khabbab, I want to become a Muslim. Where can I go to meet Muhammad? And so Khabbab told him, go and meet him in Dar al arqam and so Umar radiallahu anhu, he went to Dar al-Arqam and he knocked on the door. And at that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was holding a secret meeting with his companions. And so one of his companions stood up and peeked through the door and saw Umar radiallahu anhu, standing there. And so he came and told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so it mentions in, in the narration that this companion was extremely frightened. And he said, 
or Umar ibn Khattab is outside. And he's even carrying his sword. And so the Sahabi was understandably afraid. So now who in that gathering, who in that gathering dared to open the door? Who in that gathering offered that, oh, Ya Rasulullah, let me go and open the door? Yes. The first one to stand up was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. And so he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if Umar has come for a good reason, then we will treat him in kind. But if he has come with the wrong intentions, then I will kill him with his own sword. And so Rasulullah told Hamza, no. I will go and open the door for him. And so Rasulullah went himself. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his personal physical physique, he was said to be a man of medium height and medium build. While Umar radiallahu an was known to be very tall. And he had a very, a very well built. He was extremely fit. And he was strong and he was huge. He was very tall. And yet, here was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showing his courage that he can take him on. And so imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in front of this huge man. It is mentioned in one narration that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he, he, he opened the door and immediately dragged Umar by his clothes, dragged him in and pinned him to the ground. And he said, Oh Umar, why don't you stop? Are you waiting for Allah to strike you with a calamity? To punish you? And so Umar ibn Khattab, he said, O Messenger of Allah, I have come to become a Muslim. I have come to become a Muslim. And so this happened near the door. As for all the other companions, they had gone into a room to hide themselves. So they didn't know what was going on. So when Umar said that to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Allahu Akbar. And all of the Sahaba, they heard this. And they realized that Umar had become a Muslim. So they were so happy with this news that they also made takbir. And so it's mentioned in the narrations that they made takbir so loud that they had to immediately disperse because Quraysh outside had heard them. And so this was the Islam of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. And his Islam was a turning point in the history of Islam in Mecca. It was truly a turning point. And that's why Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu he says that the Islam of Umar was a victory. And his migration to Medina was a help for Islam. And his reign, meaning when he was reigning as a Khalifa later on, it was a reign of mercy. His Islam was a victory for the Muslims. His migration to Medina was a source of help. And his reign, his authority, when he be, became a Khalifa, was a reign of mercy. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud also says, we were never able to pray in front of the Kaaba publicly. 
until Umar had become a Muslim. And so the Islam of one person changed the situation of the entire Muslim community. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he also says, we used to conceal our Islam. We would hide our Islam until Umar had become a Muslim. Then we would proudly proclaim our Islam. It's also mentioned in one of the narrations of the seerah that when Umar became a Muslim, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lined up the Muslims in two lines, in two rows. One was headed by Hamza and the other was headed by Umar. And then they would march down the streets of Mecca publicly proclaiming their deen while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa walked between the two lines. And so this shows us the strength and the empowerment that resulted through the Islam of Umar radiallahu anhu. He had this boldness and this courage and this power that frightened his enemies. In fact, in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says that when Umar walks down one road, shaitan takes another road. To the point where even shaitan is afraid of Umar radiallahu anhu. Now, when Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu became a Muslim, he didn't stop there. He asked, who has the biggest mouth in Mecca? Who can publicize this news for me? You know, I want the people to know that I have become a Muslim. And so he didn't want to take it step by step. He wanted everyone to know that he had become a Muslim. Similar to other companions when they became Muslims, and we mentioned examples of that previously, like Abu Dhar radiallahu an, he was from outside of Mecca and after he became a Muslim at the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him instructions not to announce his Islam, but he felt too proud and he valued his Islam so much that he went to the Kaaba and he told everyone in front of everyone that, you know, I have become a Muslim. And he said the shahada until they came and he, they beat him. They beat him up so bad. And we mentioned that story when we mentioned the story of Abu Dar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. So they told Umar, there's a man by the name of Jamil ibn Ma'mar al-Jumahi. Go to him. So the son of Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, he says, at that time I was very young, but I still remember everything that I saw. He says, I followed my father and he went to this man, Jamil, and he said to him, do you know what I did? Jamil said, what? He said, I have become a Muslim. So Abdullah ibn Umar says, immediately, as soon as Jamil heard this news, he stood up dragging his gown behind him and went, went running towards the Kaaba. And he went in front of everyone and started to scream on top of his, at the top of his lungs. O people of Quraysh, Umar has become a savior. Saba'a. This was the word, this was the name that the kuffar would give to the Muslims. It was like a derogatory name. You know, like uh, nowadays they say, you know, they're terrorists, they're fundamentalists, they're backwards. So they would say, they would call the Muslims Sabi'a. And Sabi'a, they were a sect or a religion that existed, and Allah has mentioned them in the Quran, was Sabi'un. And so he was yelling, Umar has become a Sabian. When Umar heard that, he corrected him. He said, no, 
I have become a Muslim. But the man, he, he didn't care. He wasn't hearing anything that Umar was saying now. He was too busy pub publicizing this news. Abdullah ibn Umar, his son, he says, so the people surrounded my father from every direction. And they started to beat him. And so they were fighting for hours. Because of the strength of Umar, he was defending himself. So they were beating him and he was beating them. And so they were fighting for hours until the sun was right on top of their heads. And it was too hot to continue. Then Umar radiallahu an, he went home. But the people had not left him. They came and surrounded his house. And they wanted to kill Umar. And so this news was too much for them. You know, it was disappointing. And so Abdullah ibn Umar, he says, my father was at home. And then a man, he came and he asked my father, what's wrong? What's going on? So Umar, he said, these people want to kill me. So the man, he said, no, they will not kill you. And he stood outside and he said to all the people, he said, leave him alone. Doesn't he have the right to choose the religion that he wants to believe in? I am giving him protection. I am giving him protection. If you want to mess with him, you have to mess with me. And this is, this was a culture uh, of the Arabs that they would give protection to one another. Like... Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the protection of his uncle Abu Talib. So they couldn't touch the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or they could not kill him. And so Abdullah ibn Umar, he says, immediately the people left. Now, Abdullah ibn Umar, later on, he says that later on, when we were in Medina, I asked my father, who is that man who came and helped you? So Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, my son, that was Al-As ibn Wa'il. Al-As ibn Wa'il. And he was the father of who? He was the father of Amr ibn Al-As. Amr ibn Al-As. He wasn't a Muslim. He wasn't a Muslim. But he was from the family of Umar ibn Khattab. They were from the, st the, the same family. And so they were allies. They were allies. And we mentioned Amr ibn al-As last week. Who was Amr ibn al-As? Or what was the role that he played in the story of the migration to al-Habasha? Yeah, so he was the head of the delegation that Quraysh sent to the Najashi, Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As, he was a kafir, as we saw in that story, but later on he becomes a Muslim. Amr ibn al-As became a Muslim later on. So did his son, Abdullah ibn Amr, one of the famous companions. So anyways, the man who gave protection to Umar was al-As ibn Wa'il. And so this is the story of the Islam of Umar radiallahu anhu. We'll suffice with that. We can't go more in detail. Uh, otherwise, there is much that can be said about Umar ibn Khattab. Especially after his Islam. And what he did for Islam in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also after his death. You know, his life as the Khalifa is an entire story on its own that requires an entire discussion on its own. The life of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. But this is what we will suffice with here. And so we move on to the lessons that we learn from the Islam of these two great men, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. The first lesson that we learn from the story of Hamza 
radiallahu an, is that what matters is the end result, not the faulty beginning. Al-umur bi khawatimiha. We look at the end result. And so Hamza's Islam started off shaky. It started off with tribal pride. But then it ended up being sincere. And one of the Salaf, Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, طَلَبْنَا الْعِلْمَ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ فَأَبَى أَنْ يَكُونَ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ فَأَبَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ that we started our study of Islam for other than Allah's sake, but Allah refused except for it to be solely for His sake. What this means is that intentionally, it is that initially, initially, their intention was that they didn't start seeking knowledge of the deen sincerely for the sake of Allah but rather maybe to show off or you know to to gain knowledge in order to argue and debate and this is a huge pitfall in seeking knowledge and that's why the scholars always speak about the importance of ikhlas sincerity of the intention when seeking knowledge of the deen so Initially, it started off like that, but by learning the deen more, it humbled them, and so they became sincere. So they started with the wrong intention, but down the line, their intention was rectified and corrected. And so what matters is the end result. What matters is the end result. It doesn't matter how you began, as long as, as, long as you fix yourself, and then do whatever you do sincerely for the sake of Allah. That is what we learn from the story of Hamza radiallahu anhu. The second lesson that we learn from both Hamza and Umar radiallahu anhu is that empowerment comes from patience and sacrifice. And the relief comes from the stress and We cannot expect to all of a sudden have the upper hand and be victorious against our enemies and to become strong and, you know, to completely uh, have the upper hand and become powerful without, without taking the steps that lead to that empowerment. So we cannot expect we cannot expect to jump these steps. There are certain steps that we have to take in order to reach the end goal. And and this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we spoke about this previously. When we spoke about the persecution that the Muslims had faced in Mecca and how Khabbab ibn Arat came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said Ya Rasulullah, ala tad'u lana? Will you not pray to Allah for us? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded by becoming very angry and Khabbab ibn Arat said Allah will not answer and so the reason why the Prophet became angry like that was because he sensed that the companions had started to give up. Likewise, we cannot give up. We have to understand that there are steps that are required in order to reach empowerment, to reach victory. These steps require us to go through hardship, 
go through difficult times. And so the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم, they went through that. And they did not give up. And eventually Allah rewards them there with, with the Islam of Hamza and Umar رضي الله عنهم. Their wives are strengthened and empowered to do this. The third lesson I'm going to learn is the importance of targeting influential people in our death. The importance of targeting influential people in our death. The Prophet would send a view the traits of people very well. He knew what certain people have, what good traits they have that can bring good to this now, even though they were enemies of Islam. And so that is why he made dua to Allah, asking Allah to guide one of the two of Why specifically these two individuals? The Prophet could have prayed to Allah for other great men of Quraysh to to become Muslim, but why specifically these two people? Because they had certain qualities that would make them outstanding leaders. And so, Abu Jahl, he used to be called by his people what? He wasn't called Abu Jahl. That nickname was given to him by the Prophet. The father of ignorance. Why did the Prophet so long that he was going to give him that nickname? Yes, but also because he used to be called Abu al Hakam, the man of wisdom. So when the Prophet وسلم, saw that he wasn't using his intelligence to accept Islam, he said it's better we call him Abu Jahl. But what is it that these two men had? It was the quality of determination. And so they had determination and commitment to a cause. That if they believed in something, they were willing to work for it until the very end. And so they were very strong as well. They were very brave men who would rise above everyone else in difficult situations. And so Rasulullah was looking at these personal qualities which made him to make that dua. Likewise, we need to look for such influential people who have good qualities, who could bring who could bring good to Islam. Because with their Islam will come the Islam of many other people. Because they are influential and they have a following. And so these are the kinds of people that we need to target in our da'wah. The fourth lesson that we learn is from a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, خِيَارُكُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ خِيَارُكُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ The Prophet ﷺ said, the best of you in Jahiliyyah are the best of you in Islam. But he didn't stop. He said, the best of you in Jahiliyyah are the best of you in Islam if they gain understanding of the deen. If they gain understanding of the deen. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa means here in his statement that the people who have good personal qualities before Islam, they are an asset when they become Muslim. And they will become the best Muslims because of those good personal qualities. As long as they gain an understanding. In Fakhi. And so here the Prophet did not make it an open ended statement. You know? Because if it's just like 
best of you in Islam, then there are people who, without knowledge of the deen, they could cause a lot of damage. And we've seen that throughout our history. That there are people who had good qualities in Jahiliyyah, and they brought these qualities with them in Islam, but because they didn't gain an understanding of the deen, they brought more damage. Uh, and so this shows the importance of Islam. Knowledge, even if you have good personal qualities, it's not enough. We know, we know being a good understanding of the fifth and final lesson that we'll take here comes from the story of Umar radiallahu the love. That the Sahaba had for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so when Naim, the relative of Umar, when he met Umar ibn Khattab, and so he put. The sister of Umar and her husband he put them in danger. Right? He put them in danger. For Umar, he had a sword work. He could go and chop off their heads. So he put them in danger. But he did so, he did so for a greater cause. And that was to save the life of the Prophet And so, why would Na'im do such a thing? He wanted to save the life of the Prophet even if it meant putting other people's lives in danger because of the love that the Sahaba had for the Prophet They were willing to put their lives on the line as the lives of their fellow or defending him, or saving his life. And this is one of the signs of Kina. The Prophet says, Ya yu'minu ahadikum hasta akuna habba ilayhi min waladihi wa walidihi wa nasi ajma'in. That none of you truly believes until I am more beloved to him than his son, his father, and all of mankind. And so the Sahaba loved the Prophet more than they loved even their dearest relatives. And in one hadith, in one area, the Prophet said to that even yourself, because Umar, when he heard this, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you are more beloved to me than, than everyone except for myself. For the Prophet said, no, even yourself. And so Umar said, okay, even yourself. And so these are the lessons that we learn from the lives of these two companions and their Islam and how it changed the situation in Mecca for the Muslims. And so next week, we're going to go on to another event in the Sirah in Mecca that resulted from the Islam of Hamza and Umar radiallahu anhu. And so Quraysh, when they saw that
توكيد وقته لديه صلى الله عليه وسلم على ابيها محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته